So I want to invite up to the podium our next speaker, Dr. Ian White, and a, a good friend, and a, I have found him to be one of the more fabulous presenters, so, uh, and entertaining as well, something that I appreciate. He's the Chief Executive Officer and Founder and Chief Scientific Officer of Neobiasis. Now, how I know, how I know Ian is he is uh, on the Board of Directors of the American College of Regenerative Medicine, a medical society that is trying to make sure that the, our MDs are up to speed and our medical practitioners are compliant and have the best tools necessary to uh, deal with this emerging field of medicine. Also, he's co-founder of the Space Aging Research Institute, a new organization that combines what we are interested in is the Health Span Action Coalition and the Space Aging Research Institute and the American College for Regenerative Medicine are members of the Health Span Action Coalition. So Dr. White is a leading expert in the field of aging and regenerative medicine with 20 years experience working with stem cells, regenerative cells, and tissue engineering. He has uh, uh, most recently been with the Interdisciplinary Stem Cell Institute at the University of Miami and now has got the entrepreneurial bug with neobiasis. He speaks at many uh, longevity meetings and also medical meetings and really travels the ecosystem informing the public and our communities. Let me welcome Dr. Ian White. Well, well, thank you for that wonderful introduction, Bernie. And um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for making it out. Um, I just flew in last night from Vegas where I was speaking at the Cell Surgical Network. So forgive me if I seem a little lethargic as there's been a lot of traveling over the last few days. Um, I put together a small presentation today. Uh, this is the public session, so there's not, it's not very heavy on the science. Uh, anybody interested in the science behind what I'm going to talk about today um, is certainly welcome to talk to me afterwards. I'm going to be around uh, for, the, for the next few days. I like to move around a little bit, so uh, hopefully you can see me okay. All right, let's get started. Um, so I'm talking today as the founder of Sari. Uh, as Bernie mentioned, I've, I'm involved with a lot of other uh, organizations as well. I spent a lot of time promoting the idea of aging and how it pertains to regenerative medicine um, and aging as a disease, which is critical for uh, funding opportunities to, um, as you'll see towards the end of the presentation as well, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so if you're interested in what I'm doing at Sari, it's a brand new institute we're looking for funding um, right now, but it's very exciting. We're using space as a tool to study aging, and I'm going to explain uh, that a little bit uh, here today. So, okay, uh, yeah, there's just one disclosure right now is that uh, if you're a little bit squeamish, there are some medical images towards the end of the presentation. So I just wanted to give everybody a heads up. I wasn't sure who was going to be present in the audience. Okay, so as I mentioned, disease, I'm sorry, aging is really uh, a disease. Everybody just sort of thinks of aging as an inevitable consequence of being alive, um, and it's just something we have to deal with. Uh, that's not really the case. If you think about it, pretty much everything we die from, at least 75% of deaths are due to the aging process, whether it's cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative disease. All of these diseases are preventable if we can understand the mechanisms of aging and, um, and leverage our medical experience to pause or reverse that process rather than trying to deal with the downstream consequences of that aging. So we lose about 100,000 people a day, a day, to aging. And so that's something we really want to fix. And I believe it is fixable because innately we have this ability to repair our tissues. And if we didn't, we wouldn't be here anyway. We're constantly repairing our tissues. When we're young, as you can see in these images here, we maintain a very robust physiology. But over time, that's lost. And it's lost through a conserved mechanism that we share with a lot of other species on this planet. And it's designed to time us out. It removes us from the population. The aging process is the off switch. 
It slowly degenerates our tissue. We, we turn off the genes that are responsible for repair, responsible for regeneration, and we end up uh, degenerating to a point where we um, cease to exist. So if aging is really just like aging of a car, you just, you rust away, you accumulate damage over time, it's just an inevitable consequence, then there wouldn't be much we could do about it. But that's not how we age. We don't age the same way as an automobile might age. We have these abilities within us to get rid of tissue that's damaged. I'm talking about senescent cells and replace them with younger, more robust cells. That process is lost as we age, but it's maintained in many other animal species. And we can learn from those species, and that's one of the things that we're, we intend to do at SARI, is understand how many of these species that retain a robust ability to repair and regenerate do so. It's all to do with the epigenetics, I'm not gonna get into that right now, but species like lobsters, they don't age. They just continue to grow to a point where they get so large they can't molt anymore. The energy expenditure required to molt exceeds the uh, amount of energy that the lobster has available to it. So it just, it dies under its own weight during the molting process. But if you look at its cells, there are no markers of aging in that species, in those species, uh, which is quite phenomenal. So aging is not just a linear process. It is a process that undergoes uh, repair and regeneration. And it does that through endogenous stem cell pools. So throughout our body, we have stem cell niches in all of our tissues, our bone, our muscles, our brain, and maybe even our hearts, but that's a bit controversial right now. The problem is we lose the ability over time to utilize those uh, stem cells. When we're first born, and in fact, in utero, we have a 100% capacity to repair and regenerate tissue. As soon as we're born, we lose that ability and it progressively declines uh, as we get older. And as an example, you probably remember when you were younger, if you scraped your knee, you healed very fast. The pain was minimal, you healed very fast and typically no scarring. If you, do, if you have the same accident when you're older, if you fall and scrape your knee, the chances are it's gonna take a long time to heal and the result is probably gonna be a scar. So this is the aging process, or at least this is a, a major part of it. This isn't the whole story. But it all comes down to stem cell depletion. As we age, we continually utilize the stem cell pools in our body, but their ability to replenish declines. So we're exhausting the stem cell pool while our requirement for stem cells continues to increase. So we get to this point here of old age and death where our demand is, uh, greatly outweighs the supply. Now, what a lot of people don't know is that all of those processes that I just talked about are accelerated in space. So what we've been learning from a lot of the astronauts and cosmonauts that are coming back and all the experiments using mice is that any extended period of time in space greater than six weeks results in major physiological changes in the body that very closely resemble accelerated aging. So you can't see the details on here, but I'm happy to make the slides available. This was just something I pulled off of NASA. But every organ in the body, including the skin, skin's an organ, degenerates faster in space than it does on Earth. And there are a lot of different reasons for that, and we don't necessarily understand them all. One of them is the exposure to radiation. So for example here, um, I don't have a pointer, I guess, do I have a pointer? I don't need a pointer. Um, on the graph here, the first bar is the annual cosmic radiation we experience at sea level on Earth. If we go over a little bit to the yellow, orange, and red, that's six months on the ISS in yellow, 180 days in transit to Mars, and 500 days on Mars. That's the amount of cosmic radiation we're being exposed to that damages our tissue and accelerates aging. But of course, just being in microgravity accelerates aging as well. So why am I talking to you about this and why am I interested in this? Well, this is a, a, an image uh, that was taken a couple of years ago. Um, Doug Hurley made it to the space station and even before he set, stepped foot onto the space station, he bumped his head and cut himself. Now, luckily it wasn't a big deal for him. He had just come from Earth and he had a very robust immune system. 
But if he had spent time on the space station already and injured himself, that could have become a much more serious injury. The skin's ability to heal decreases dramatically with extended stays in space, and the skin's ability to fight microbial infection decreases dramatically as well. So if we're going to be spending any time on the ISS, we're going to be spending any time on, uh, on the moon, or if we're going to be spending any time trying to get to Mars, we need to understand the body's response to space travel. Why, why does the body accelerate aging in space? And more importantly, what can we understand about that process to apply it to the aging process itself? Can we use space itself as a tool to study aging? So here's a, a quote from um, Dennis Orgel at, at Harvard, just to sort of reiterate what I'm saying. So during the aging process, the body's capacity to repair skin diminishes as we get older. There just aren't enough growth factors and stem cells available as we age. And in fact, it's not just the number, it's actually their capacity to repair as well. This is a, a graph published by um, Arno Kaplan a few years ago when he's talking about uh, MSCs. We know now that MSCs are not stem cells, so I've got a disclaimer there, even though it does say st uh, stem cells on the slide. But what was, this is demonstrating is that not only do we lose the number of stem cells in our niches, their ability to regenerate, their fitness, dramatically decreases as soon as you're born. This first graph here is a newborn. Uh, you, the numbers are irrelevant at, uh, at this point. It's just for um, demonstration purposes. But there's a huge capacity of our regenerative cells to regenerate and repair at birth. And that is immediately lost. The first bar graph is uh, teen, then we're looking at 30, 50, and 60 years old. So if we're going to study aging, we can't study old tissue. We need to study uh, young tissue. And I have a few other slides here that I, that I took out because uh, of, in the interest of time. But what if there's a way that we could trick old skin into thinking that it was young, so turning back that clock using those growth factors that are now missing? Again, as soon as we're born, we have this huge capacity. All of our young cells retain um, a significant increase in regenerative capacity compared to older cells. And this has been demonstrated experimentally. If you're familiar with this experiment, it's called uh, heterochronic parabiosis. And this is one of the experiments that really inspired me initially to get into the aging and regenerative medicine space. What this experiment showed was that if you take a young mouse and you take an old mouse and you suture them together so they share a blood supply, the young mouse gets older, but the old mouse gets younger. So all the markers of aging start to decline the biochemical signals, but also the physiological um, measurements as well, like grip strength, cognitive ability. They all start to improve when you share young blood. And in fact, this can be recapitulated just simply by taking young plasma and injecting it into the old individual. So there was something in there that the scientists at the time were calling rejuvenating factors that we now understand to be exosomes. These exosomes from young tissues harbor signals that are able to convince old tissue that it's young again. And in Neobiosis, what we discovered, and we were the first to publish on this, is that there's a natural form of heterochronic, heterochronic parabiosis, and that's pregnancy. You have a young individual and an old individual sharing a blood supply. The young individual is benefiting from the growth factors produced by the placenta and the mother. But the mother's also benefiting from the growth factors and the exosomes from the developing fetus. The mother's skin quality improves, her cognitive ability improves, her high eyesight improves, hair quality improves during pregnancy. This is all to increase the robustness of her tissues to deal with the rigors of pregnancy. The young tissue is convincing the old tissue that it's young and it's healing like it did when it was younger. It's repairing like it did when it was younger. And we're able to recapitulate this artificially in an experiment as well. This is called an epithelial cell wound healing assay. If we take those exosomes that accumulate in the amniotic fluid, so the young tissue with the young signals, and we apply them to old epithelial cells, so epithelial cells are responsible for healing wounds, all we do is drip the amniotic fluid onto the epithelial cells in a wound healing assay where you've got a, an area of, um, on the plate where there are no epithelial cells. The amniotic fluid is able to activate them and induce them to migrate 
as if re repairing the wound. And this is some of my own research. So we didn't use exosomes here, but we did use the signals in the exosomes, the growth factors, to study cardiovascular repair. So I've been very interested in how the heart degenerates, especially in space. The heart is very compromised during space travel. But it's also the, one of the largest killers of Americans that there is. Cardiovascular disease kills more people than anything else. And it's because the heart can't repair itself as we age. But one of the things, I'm not going to get into the details of this right now, but one of the things we discovered in collaboration with other groups is that there's a window. There's a two-day window after we're born, after mammals are born, where the heart retains a capacity to regenerate itself. And if you look at the growth factors that are present and uh, that are being signaled between the epithelium, I'm sorry, the, end, the endothelium, the vascular endothelium, and the nerves, if you look at the signaling molecules that are being communicated during that two-day window, you can do something quite remarkable. So again, the human heart and the mammalian heart does not have a capacity to regenerate after birth, except there's maybe a 1% turnover per year for your lifetime. But that's really irrelevant when it comes to cardiac injury and cardiovascular disease. So what we did was we took a mouse heart, I removed the atria just for simplicity, and we put it in a Petri dish, and I used canonical uh, cardiomyocyte growth media, and what we saw was that everything died. So on this left-hand panel, you can see this is a very uh, atrophied heart, and you have coagulated necrosis here. There's nothing surviving. But if I take those signals that are present in the first two days, that are present in exosomes, in the young tissue, and I apply it to this cultured heart, you can see here, hopefully you can see it, all of these, you see a, a much larger um, cross-section of the heart. This is uh, histology. If we zoom in, we can see that they, you can make out the sarcomeres, you can make out the nuclei. This is a healthy heart. And in fact, you may not be able to make it out there, but after two weeks in culture, you can still see the heart's beating. Normally, when you take a heart out of a mouse and you put it in a Petri dish, you're just studying necrosis. In this case, two weeks later, the heart is still beating. It's a healthy heart, just by su supplementing those growth factors. But what about repair and regeneration? So again, I took those growth factors, but I supplemented them with some pro-regenerative growth factors. And I tried the similar experiment. I took a mouse heart, but I injured the left ventricle. I, put a little, I took a little nick out of the bottom of the left ventricle, you can see here. So in the top panel is a, um, a zoom in of the, uh, the, the injury. Day three, you can already see that it's starting to fill with extracellular matrix. By day 21, it's completely recellularized. If we look at the histology, we can see the cells starting to migrate in, and by day 21, completely recellularized. Here in red, this is EDU. This is a marker of proliferation. You can see only in this, the area of injury. Remember, mammalian hearts do not regenerate. But by taking those young growth signals, we're able to get the cells to proliferate in the site of injury. And the final panel H there shows a completely recellularized injury with very little collagen, very little scar tissue. Uh, this other panel here is, um, I'll just quickly mention it. This just demonstrates that it's, the repair is driven by the epicardium. So there's a, a single layer of cells that, that, that go around the heart, that surround the heart. They were thought to be pretty inert. They didn't really do very much. But it turns out that these are actually the regenerative cells of the heart. And when you injure the heart, they migrate into the wound. What I did here is I created a mouse uh, genetically where all of the tissues are red, except for the epicardium, which is green. And then when I injured it, you can see the green cells migrating into the injury. All right, that's just in case there's anybody squeamish in the, in the audience. So what about clinical applications? So if we can show experimentally that by taking young signals and giving it to cells or giving it to animals, we can repair tissue, can we do it in adults too? Well, this is an autoimmune disease. This is red skin syndrome, steroid withdrawal. I show this uh, slide a lot, but I have some others. This patient was like this for five years. Her legs, her hands, her chest, and her face were completely destroyed with autoimmune disease. Nothing in conventional medicine, nothing in standard of care was helping her. So what we did was we donated some tissue to her physician, uh, sorry, we donated some uh, purified amniotic fluid to her physician and some umbilical cord cells, and they injected them, and within one week, we broke the cycle of the autoimmune disease. That's her feet one week, this is her arm two weeks later. She had four treatments in the course of the year, and now that autoimmune disease is completely shut off. Now she's completely back to normal. 
after five years with, with uh, nothing in conventional medicine helping. This is another example. This is published, so you can look it up. It was also featured on the news. This is a firework incident last year. So a firework fell over and it shot into the crowd and exploded on uh, a, a woman's leg. She almost lost the leg. She re received third degree burns. When she went to the hospital, she was in 10 out of 10 pain. Nobody could ch change her bandages. She couldn't shower. She couldn't sleep because of the pain. She happened to work for a regenerative medicine clinic. We donated some amniotic fluid. They applied it topically. Her burn physician predicted two to three months recovery period with extensive skin grafting. Two to three months, extensive skin grafting. We applied the product. That's the result six days later. It's almost as if the injuries have been wiped away. We've tricked the adult skin, which would normally take two to three months to recover, because again, the adult doesn't really want to fix itself. The adult is trying to get out of here. We're trying to age so we can make space for the next generation. That's a topic for another um, presentation. But all of the regenerative um, uh, genes in our body are slowly being turned off. When we apply perinatal products, we are somehow able to epigenetically modify those genes and turn them back on. I've got a, uh, maybe one or two more uh, slides. This is uh, an example of pyroderma gangrenosum. So this came from a dog bite. An elderly individual was bitten by a dog, two puncture wounds that got infected and progressively got worse over the course of three or four months to a point where they were now an amputation candidate. So they were discussing amputation with their physician. When they reached out to us, we donated some product. It was, we, uh, they applied it topically. Over the course of one month, we were able to resolve the disease and save the leg. Last slide, I believe. This is an example of uh, diabetic uh, Achilles ulcer. So this patient uh, has diabetes, had a heart attack, was admitted to the hospital. During the time they were in the hospital, they developed an ulcer on their Achilles tendon, which progressively got worse over the course of a couple of months. Nothing in standard of care was helping. He was in pain. Oh, that's something I forgot to mention in, with the firework incident. She was in 10 out of 10 pain. 30 minutes after application of the amniotic fluid, she went to a two out of 10 pain. She was able to change the bandages, but most importantly, she was off opioids, which is critical because of the opioid epidemic that we've initiated in the United States. She was off opioids, two out of 10 pain. She was able to shower, she was able to sleep. Her quality of life improved. Same with this gentleman. We started applying the amniotic fluid just topically. We would just drip it into the wound and put a Band-Aid over. The pain went away immediately, the first day. And over the course of three months, it took some time because this was a non-responsive refractory uh, a diabetic ulcer, we were able to repair the tissue and had brand new skin, baby soft, brand new skin at the site of the injury. Hardly anything in modern medicine works like this does in refractory uh, ulcers. So I'll finish with a couple of summary slides. The whole aging field is extremely exciting because what we're doing is we're looking up here at the diseases that are most responsible for killing the majority of people. If you're over 65, you have, what is it, an 80% chance of developing at least one age-related age disease, whether it's cardiovascular disease, hypertension, arthritis, diabetes, uh, heart failure. You have an 80% chance. And we're pouring money into studying these diseases. We spend about $4.1 trillion studying these various diseases of aging. But if we study the mechanism of aging, we may be able to pause, reverse, slow that process so we don't lose as many people to the, the diseases that are associated with, with aging, cardiovascular disease, etc. And that's where space comes in. Space is a unique tool that we can study aging in a way that we can't or haven't been able to previously. Getting to space has been too expensive. Now it's becoming more affordable. Space is a brand new tool that researchers now have at their disposal to study the accelerated process of aging. And if we're going to be spending any time on the moon, any significant time on the space station, or if we intend to go to Mars, we absolutely need to understand the process of aging and how we can tap into that innate ability of the body to regenerate and repair itself that it had at birth and be able to translate that to, uh, to the 
all their individuals. So that's my presentation. Again, if you're interested, check out Sari, uh, brand new organization, but um, hopefully you found that interesting. I'm going to be around for a couple of days if you have any questions. Do we have time for questions? I don't know if that, yeah, if, if there are any questions, I'll take questions, but thank you. Question. Do you want a microphone? Okay, I'll just repeat it. If I yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the question is, what's the difference between topical application and um, IV infusion or other routes of administration? Well. With the case of the Achilles tendon, it was avascular. So by injecting IV, we're not going to get to the site. So for that purpose, uh, a topical application was a, was, was a good choice because we were able to induce angiogenesis, um, neoangiogenesis in that site and actually repair the tissue that way. Um, if we're talking about a systemic inflammation, and most diseases have a systemic inflammatory component, then IV uh, administration is definitely the way to go. A lot of physicians that are using these products are doing combinations, especially if we're talking about joints. You want to reduce the global inflammation with an IV infusion and then go into the, um, the joint with a, either a Wharton's jelly or a, uh, an amniotic fluid to actually treat the area directly. So the Wharton's jelly requires local application because of the physical properties. It's, it's, it's high in hyaluronic acid and chondritin sulfate, which, which, are, and which means that the... Uh, the Wharton's jelly is a non-Newtonian fluid. So just like synovial fluid, when you jump, um, you don't bang your knees together. You don't bang, bang the cartilage together. The, the synovial fluid actually becomes a semi-solid for a fraction of a second to withstand that, that pressure, which is, which is fascinating. And Wharton's jelly does the same thing. It's a non-Newtonian fluid that under pressure, so you've heard of oobleck, right? You know, yeah, so if you po poke your finger in slowly into oobleck, it goes in just like porridge. But if you hit it with a hammer, you know, it's, so it's solid. So the same thing with Wharton's jelly, same thing with synovial fluid. Under that pressure, it's able to withstand, um, uh, uh, it's able to withstand the pressure and, um, and, and disseminate that energy. So for that purpose, it absolutely needs to be local. For systemic inflammation and other inflammatory issues, then you can go IV. Yeah, so a lot of back issues where you don't want to be going like necessarily into the facets or anything, you can go intramuscular around it and it will diffuse. So it's very diffusible, especially the amniotic fluid. It's a liquid, um, it's, a non, it's, it's a Newtonian liquid, so it can actually diffuse very easily. But, hey, Sorry, Camilo. Fascinating. Uh, I think it, it's great that you mention exosome extracellular vesicles in uh, anti-aging effect because uh, we published a few years ago that the effect that you see with uh, umbilical cord or other youthful MSCs on tripling the lifespan of progeria mice 70-80% is done by their exosome extracellular vesicle. But I, I was intrigued by the space uh, accelerated aging evidence and uh, I'm actually talking at a meeting in Italy on the role of exercise and physical activity on uh, uh, preventing accelerated aging and yep. through sirtuin activation and other beneficial effects. Yeah. And I'm wondering if in microgravity Maybe it's like an accelerated lack of physical exercise yeah. and, uh, and, and stimulation on, on yeah. speed. So it's multifaceted. The, the aging process that's accelerated in space is multifaceted. Just by doing simple unloading experiments on the hind limbs of rodents, you see accelerated aging in that tissue as well and a lack of regenerative repair. So yes, it's all combined, a lack of pressure. That's why they have those you know, um, bungee-related uh, yeah. treadmills in space to try to give that loading uh, back again. So yeah, it's all absolutely so In related. a way, it's the opposite of exercise. Sorry? In a way, it's the opposite of exercise and physical activity. When you're in space, you have to... It's, the, it's, it's like being a cou the, the ultimate couch potato. Yeah. yeah. I, re exercise actually contributes to the anti-aging process. The, the constant injury that you're causing your body keeps your body at a high alert um, level. So you're constantly regenerating your stem cells and constantly putting them out into the body. So without exercise, we definitely age faster. Yeah, excellent uh, talk. What is Thanks. the path from to take the breakthroughs you've just shown us, especially about the regeneration and so forth, 
so that they are available pretty much everywhere. If I'm in Des Moines, if I'm in wherever, and I have an injury or whatever, yeah. that's going to be the treatment. What's the path? Is it an economic issue? Is it an institutional issue? Yeah. What's keeping this from being everywhere? Uh, regulations are keeping it, but, ah. uh, but you know we <laughs> we, we, ha we have we have a we have a manufacturing facility and we do sell to physicians. Uh, we have um, actually I don't know if I told you Bernie, but we just got our IND approved by the FDA uh, this week uh, for a clinical trial for post-COVID syndrome using the amniotic fluid. So there are pathways; they're very difficult pathways for the most part. Uh, we just had an audit with the FDA. They came to our lab. They spent two weeks with us. Um, we did very well, uh, but they are fully aware that we manufacture these products and physicians utilize them uh, because of course physicians uh, can do whatever they want essentially in the privacy of their own clinic they are free to practice medicine the FDA does not have any oversight in how physicians yeah. practice medicine but they do have oversight in how I manufacture the product so my goal is to manufacture the safest most efficient product possible and then make it available to physicians to utilize however they see right have safe. you ever thought of if there were no FDA what kind of practices would you have to make sure that the products are safe and effective yeah. and get to the patients years before going through yeah. the FDA? Well, we, so we've, we did all the experiments before the FDA even inspected us. You know, we, one of the reasons I started in this industry is because I went to the World Stem Cell Summit um, years ago and I saw that there were manufacturers making products and they had no experience. They were not PhDs, they were not MDs. They were learning how to do this stuff from Googling. So uh, I started with Pascal Goldschmidt, who was the Dean Emeritus of the University of Miami Medical School. And together with our reputations, we wanted to put out a product that we could demonstrate was safe, was effective based on our reputations. And so we did all the appropriate tests validations to show it's safe we show that it's effective we have all the data um, and now we're responsible to the FDA we have uh, CGMP compliance and we have the FDA overseeing that if the FDA weren't there we would still be able to self-regulate we would I'm not saying the entire industry but certainly we could Doug he asked all the questions I was gonna ask so. <laughs> <laughs> great minds think alike but, the, but, that, but that's that's fine welcome yeah. back by the way thank you same to you, nice to see you. A wonderful presentation. Um, so uh, what about the idea of taking uh, uh, sort of a common denominator, broad spectrum application of the mechanisms of action yeah. that you're describing? I was intrigued regarding the, the wound healing. And one of the things, as we know, with wounds that is, uh, especially complicated wounds, um, that is on everybody's mind who's trying to close those wounds is that the time to closure and, and the amount of time that passes, with every day that passes, there are increased risks yeah. of all kinds of complications. Yeah. And so the timing to closure of wounds is paramount. And so when you're saying that these kinds of products can take a, a burn yeah. or can take third, a, like a third degree ther burn. Thermal, thermal burns from fireworks yeah. or high impact trauma or mm -hmm. whatever. When they can take those, those particular problems and heal them in essentially six days with very yeah. little scar. Accelerated healing. Yeah. Right? That, that's a huge application for so many uh, well, situations. We're, all, we're also going further than that. We're actually developing products that can be applied to the skin immediately. Um, so uh, MS, uh, 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 like, a, like a collagen, it's yeah, like an impregnated collagen, yeah. yeah, like yeah. A extracellular matrix, a semi-solid extracellular matrix impregnated with the product. So essentially you're healing the, the, the tissue immediately because you're covering it and now you've, you're bathing it in the product. It's, and exactly. so that will, that will reduce the, the potential yeah. risk for the extended. But I, I guess my question really is, have you explored sort of a broad spectrum approach to some of these uh, technologies because the, the mechanism of action crosses over different tissue types and um, I found that always fascinating. So for patient access, the, the ability to take a broad spectrum approach could be huge. You mean like a systemic approach? Like you know, Not a systemic, lifestyle? but like a broad spectrum antibiotic. You know, um, you can take one, one antibiotic that covers several yeah. microbes. Well, well that's why the, the, the perinatal tissue works so well is because we all were bathed in it when we were, before we were born, right. right? We all have that in common. And so it works on everybody. Right. It doesn't matter your ethnicity, your skin color, it doesn't matter, it still, it still works. Exactly. And so it is a broad spectrum approach because 
amniotic fluid is required for skin to grow. It's required for the eyes to develop properly in utero. Mm -hmm. If the fetus doesn't ingest it, the gastrointestinal tract doesn't develop. The lungs don't develop. Right. So right. it's required for all of the tissues, right. um, including the, the brain. You know, when the, um, the, um, the, the, when the brain stem first forms, it's bathed in amniotic fluid. In fact, the cerebral spinal fluid is originally amniotic, amniotic fluid. fluid. So it, it, it has broad it spectrum. Fills the lungs. It does everything. It does everything. Everything. Yeah. All those signals is pro-regenerative and, and immunomodulatory. That right. is the two key components of the of the product, which is essential for pregnancy. It's essential for wound, uh, wound re repair. I just found that really fascinating. Thank you. No, oh, you're welcome. Thanks. Good. All right.